Welcome everyone. My name is Dana White. Welcome to another Myth Salon. Well, wherever you are, this afternoon, it's a crazy time in the culture. We have, uh, we've passed over 900,000 people who have been sacrificed to the pandemic that has begun to be life transforming. And it's something that gives us pause to think about what are the symbols in our life? What are the, what are the things that really anchor us and make us go forth? So I'd like to open up with a, a quick tap on the singing bowl, have a moment of silence, and let's think about what we can do to make ourselves compatible to one another and how we can bring love and compassion into the world through our activities and who we are and what we bring. Thank you. You know, one of the real joys of preparing for the myth salons is to work up the subject matter of what we're going to be talking about in a particular myth salon. And with the Mandela's, I've had the joy of just opening myself up to a whole stack of books two of which belong to one of our panelists today, Suzanne Fincher, who comes to us tonight from Georgia. And so I started making notes on the Mandela. And I'd like to just go through a, a few of my notes instead of doing a, a, a poem. Einstein starts with, take a point, stretch it into a line, curl it into a circle twist it into a sphere, and punch through the sphere. Meister Eckhart says, In the beginning God created heaven and earth, that is, the first fall of all that is, from one into two, from unity into number, from what is perfect, undivided, and indistinct, into imperfection, division, and distinction from the whole into the parts. And then I wanted to read the 42nd verse of the Tao Te Ching. Everything is the child of the Tao, from the mother of all being, the one is born, which brings forth the two. The two mothers the three, from which the 10,000 things are born. Thus, through the Tao, the great cycles of being are complete. Caterpillars transform into butterflies. Communities evolve into cultures. Cultures become humanity. Moments become time which form history. All ancestry flows through the Tao. Born as the child of awareness, time dissolves into the timeless through continuity with the Tao. Having neither beginning nor end, the eternal Tao weaves being and non-being into the here and now, yielding webs of seamless harmony, patterned by the interplay of yin and yang, the dance of the 10,000 things people see as change. All existence pursues love, harmony, coherence, and balance. While many paths reveal the expressions of the Tao, the sage knows that to experience the depths of the Tao, one must be here now. So, with that, I would like to turn it over now to my good friend and colleague, Will Lin, and let's learn much more about Burton Coppolo, squaring the circle. Will? Thanks, Dana. Um, 
so looking forward to tonight. Of course, the mandala is one of the central recurring themes for anybody who's a student of Jungian psychology or mythology. It's, it's one of the big recurring conversations and certainly one of the recurring images that moves from the psyche and into our myth. And so it's really cool for us to spend this evening uh, focusing in on the mandala, especially with some good friends that have been with us before and some new friends. Uh, you know, Dr. Dana White, who contributes to the faculty of Pacifica's myth program, uh, hosts this myth salon and produces books on mythology. My name is Will Lin. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Dana. I founded MythHouse.org and the General Education Department at Hushman College, which is a film and performing arts school where I teach myth to storytellers. Uh, David Orr, it's great to see you again, uh, coming from the Red Room in Twin Peaks. Uh, David Orr has shown his own work internationally and is in collections alongside artists such as John Baldessari, Jim Dine, Edward Weston, and David Hockney. Orr speaks about art regularly, having presented at such venues as Parsons School of Design, the Mutler Museum, Opus, the Joseph Campbell Foundation, UCLA, the Philosophical Research Society, where he founded the Hansel Gallery, established a contemporary arts program, and curated the current exhibit, Burton Coppolo. His website is davidorr.com. Hi, Sandra Del Castillo, um, PhD, received a BA from UC Berkeley and master's then doctor's degree from Pacifica in Jungian and Archetypal Studies. She is a ritual artist adjunct faculty at Pacifica and will be teaching at the Philosophical Research Society this summer. She studied mythology, indigenous medicine, and dance. Thanks for being with us. Nancy Blumstein uh, was married to Burton Coppolo, is the archivist of Coppolo's work and the author of Burton Coppolo, Past Discovery, a monograph covering Coppolo's 50 plus year career as an artist. Pleasure to have you with us tonight, thank you. Gary Kack is the author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Buddhism, editor of What Book? Uh, Buddha poems from beat to hip hop and narrator, narrator of the audio edition of his pause, breathe, smile, he writes for Tricycle, the Buddhist Review, and hosts Mindfulness Fellowship in San Francisco. His website is garygack.com, and we'll put that in the uh, feed below. Suzanne Fincher is a Jungian-oriented psychotherapist as well as a board-certified art therapist. She's an internationally known expert on mandala making for self-exploration with numerous books on mandalas, including Creating Mandalas in the Mandala Workbook, a creative guide for self-exploration, balance, and well-being, both published by Chimbala. Her website is creatingmandalas.com, which we'll also share below. Clay, it's great to have you back with us, is the author of the book Circles of Men, a counterintuitive approach to creating men's groups. He is a former Marine Corps officer, a retired business leader, and the founder and host of the podcast In Search of the New Compassionate Male. Clay has developed a unique approach to co-creating personal mandalas to provide his clients a fresh lens through which to view their life, act upon their insights, and navigate the world around them. And hi, Catherine. Uh, Catherine Hart lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and is inspired by the land, sky, and culture there. It informs her life. Majoring in fine arts and theology as an undergraduate, she continued with the study of mythology and archetypal psychology at Pacifica Graduate Institute, and her art reflects these studies. Her most recent art project is painting the mandala. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Please uh, take it from there. I'm looking forward to this evening. First of all, I'm very pleased and excited to be here. Um, and um, Sandra and Nancy and I had uh, done a presentation, a, a talk at uh, a PRS, the Philosophical Research Society. Um, and it was actually a great place to do so and to have the installation that's up because um, Burton Coppolo actually researched there. And um, as did Carl Jung, when, particularly when he was studying alchemy. Um, Jung, of course, uh, via correspondence, but Burton would actually go to the PRS library and do research and um, would actually uh, correspond with uh, Manly Hall, who was the founder of the Philosophical Research Society. So I wanted to um, take you through Burton himself. Um, he was a peripatetic artist who had a 50 plus year career, uh, showed, had one solo show towards the very end of his life, and is one of those folks that I feel is um, overlooked unfairly. And um, part of it was his integrity as an artist. Part of it was um, some things we'll learn about later when we speak with uh, Nancy and, and, and Gary. Um, but uh, this is he in 1955. Um, Burton was in World War II and went to NYU on the GI Bill and studied, got a degree in philosophy. 
And so this put him in Greenwich Village in the 50s. And it's interesting that um, you'll you'll note as we go on that he tended to actually appear or be in a part of the country that was actually a very fertile, having a very fertile moment in the art world. Um, Greenwich Village in the 1950s, uh, LA in the 1960s, the San Francisco loft scene back in, in, um, back in uh, LA uh, where he ended his career. Um, he really had a, a remarkable uh, range of phases and a remarkable range of work. Um, it's, it's quite fascinating and you'll see some themes return quite a bit. Um, I'm going to just get into it here with um, some of his work um, and then speak about the mandala form in particular. Um, so this is a piece that Burton did in 1954. Um, and this is a piece he did in 1965. Another piece from 65. And you can see there's a very sophisticated geometric uh, side to this work and obviously um, a side that's exploring a lot of symbolism um, that's pretty rich. Um, this is a tapestry he did in 1967. This is the uh, a charcoal and you can see there's really a wide range. Um, there's, you can really see there's a wide range of um, different styles and, and, and eras just in, in, a, in a fairly brief period. This is the image that became sort of the logo for the talk because it's quite uh, mythological, a tiny bit rude, um, and has a lot of energy. Um, and you can see what, as, as we go through these, when if you think about the mandala form and what he's doing, he's really exploring a lot of different facets of that form and the way it appears in mythology and in a lot of sacred texts, um, many of which he would have uh, come across it at the library at PRS. Uh, he was a very curious uh, reader. Um, and I'll, I'll show a photo of his bookcase later. He was uh, a, a a very, uh, he was self-taught, but self-taught artist, by the way. Obviously he had a degree in philosophy. So you can see he had chops and he really explored many different ways of conveying power and emotion and um, dualities and paternities, um, all the things that make a mandala form interesting. Um, and you saw earlier, there were some more myth mythological looking mandalas and he turned to more abstract work like this. This is one of the pieces in the show. And one of the things that I really am struck by by this is it's, it's from 1975. It looks like if you, you could, if a graffiti artist did this today, it wouldn't look out of place. It looks like it was painted yesterday. Um, also, I'm also a mandala artist and I tend to work a great deal with symmetry. And I have to say that um, I have respect for Burton that he um, has work that has a complete balance without resorting to symmetry. Um, I think that shows a lot of sophistication on his part. Um, this is the other per, uh, piece in the show. Um, I hope you can see it. It's, a, it's set up a little bit like the Rothko Chapel and that the two mandalas really dominate the room and you can be in there and look at one and then the other. They're on opposite walls from one another. Um, in the 80s, he was still working on these. And you can see that he is really um, exploring different ways of rendering the information, you know, and then exploring uh, outside the circle as well. And again, I love the geometries. I love the, the different forms and yet the, the, the work feels entirely balanced. We're getting into more of the 80s. He also worked in many different materials, which is sort of interesting. Um, you can see he, he worked in, in some carved wood pieces that mimic the shapes that he had in his work. Um, and that some of these are in display at PRS as well um, in the bookshop. Um, this is 85, 87. This is 92, this is one of my favorites. Um, I, 
what I like about what I, what I noticed about his work as well is that he actually managed to create work that seemed out of time and ahead of its time all at once. Um, the Magician's Illusion. And you can see at the, at the very end, completely different gestural style. You'll have to forgive me, I'm driving this from my iPhone and it's being a little bit misbehaving. Um, so we called the, 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 we titled the exhibition, The Squaring of the Circle. Um, I immediately noticed, of course, that he had created uh, the square around the central circle of a mandala as part of the work. Um, and of course, I was thinking of the Jung quote, um, you know, the squaring of the circle is one of many archetypal um, motifs which form the basic patterns of our dreams and fantasies. But it is distinguished by the fact that it is one of the most important of them from the functional point of view. Indeed, it could even be called the archetype of wholeness. Burton would have been very aware of Jung. Um, this is just one of several bookshelves that are in a studio. And he basically had a copy of everything that Jung ever wrote. Um, so it's no accident that we're, we're, we're bringing Jung into this. I mean, aside from Jung's extensive work with mandalas, and of course, he noted that the mandala form appears in every culture. Um, we say here, you know, in the products of the unconscious, we discover mandala symbols, that is circular and quaternity figures which express wholeness, and whenever we wish to express wholeness, we employ just such figures. And the circle is, of course, an extremely powerful form. And a mandala is, comes from Sanskrit for circle. And it's meant to be a map of the universe, among other things. Um, cosmos, it's interesting that that's also a word for the universe. It also means order. And that's what, where Pythagoras coined that. Um, and it immediately raises a question to me in terms of mandalas and, and the forms that they take, are we representing an order or are we following an order um, that we have a preconceived idea of? Um, Pythagoras himself came up with the monad, which is the totality of all being. Um, I'm gonna quickly go through a, a bunch of different instances here, the Ouroboros, of course, form appears in the Kabbalah, um, diagram of the supreme ultimate or known as yin and yang. This is Jung's first uh, mandala. Um, it appears in the Mayan tradition, obviously in the Buddhist tradition, Navajo tradition, Pueblo tradition, Aztec tradition, Catholic, and Islamic. This is what heaven looked like on April 25th, 1354. Um, and then of course there's elements like the Enso, which is a, a that's all, again, a circular form. And it actually has lended itself quite interestingly to music. Um, if you've ever heard around a circular canon, um, some of the composers actually wrote their scores as an unending circle that, that would just loop as the performance as the performance should. Um, this is a diagram I found that uh, John Coltrane drew for Yusuf Latif uh, as a circle of fifths, but you can see there's a fair amount of iconography in there. And he drew this around the time of Love Supreme. So it's interesting that you, you, know, you can think about his spiritual side and what he was thinking about as he was using sacred geometry to communicate uh, music to someone else. Um, this is an interface for a, a, an art project called The Long Player by Jem Feiner. Uh, as you can see, it obviously takes a circular form again with information radiating out from the center. Uh, Jem Feiner, Feiner is actually a former member of the Pogues who created a piece of music that will play for a thousand years and will not repeat. It is uh, the sounds that are generated are from Tibetan singing bowls. And you can see those are the brown uh, circles it, arranged there. And it's interesting that he too chose a circular form to represent something that's actually referring to the past, but also intended to last quite far into the future. Um, the circular form is something that we actually love to use for any kind of representation of information and including infographics. 
Um, and if you begin to take a, take a look, uh, I, I feel at this point in time, a lot of people regard information as sacred. So it's in a way appropriate that um, information is being uh, shown in mandala form um, from graphics as sophisticated as this one and beyond. And of course, all the way down to the lowly pie chart. Um, it extends to science, of course, as well. There's a lot of symmetry that it occurs. Um, one of the forms that I love here is the, the hydrogen probability pattern. And if you, if you look for further ones, this is just one of several. They're all symmetrical. They all um, are balanced. Um, and they're all where particles should appear. Um, as I said before, I'm a Mandela artist myself, and I was an artist in residence at the uh, Philosophical Research Society where I photographed manuscripts and created Mandala forms from them. Uh, this is a Kumas uh, uh, um manuscript. Um, this is the Red Book Reader's Edition, and the Red Book Reader's Edition doesn't have any of the Mandala images in it, so I decided to create a Mandala from it, uh, which I thought would be a interesting way of integrating a book that I love and has been so influential and actually turn it into what it's centered on. Um, I, I was asked to also show some of my moon mandalas. I started a project um, in fall of last year where on every Monday, moon day, I send out a mandala that I have created from images of the moon. Um, this is actually the very first one that I uh, released on September 6th. And this is something a little more recent um, from November. Um, if you go to my website, you can see all the ones that have been released. And if you email me, I can add you to the list and every Monday you will receive a mandala made from the moon. Um, the images that I'm, I'm using here are also, of course, I'm interested in the mythological aspects of it and the, um, the, the forms and the, ge the sacred geometry. I'm also interested in how they mimic um, actual data that we get from science. Here's a pattern of part of the particle paths when the uh, Large Hadron Collider uh, was first set off. And here we are back to Burton Coppolo. And again, I'm really, uh, this is a piece that I curated into a show called The Ur Unified Field. Um, and it's just remarkable again to me that it's a very sophisticated balance that does not rely on symmetry. Most mandalas are, or they have, certainly have quadrants and things like that um, to, to support it. And there's mythological reasons for that, which Sandra will get into in, in, in a little bit. Um, but you can see that he is working with asymmetry and really getting a, a wonderful balance, um, really allowing the eye to travel and to get a really good sense of energy from it that is asymmetrical and yet balanced all at once. And here's the work in the gallery space at the philosophical, at the Hensel Gallery at the Philosophical Research Society. Um, it's interesting, there's a great book called The Book of Circles by Manuel Lima, and I highly recommend it. It, it shows that um, the circle has been the go-to form to create any, to basically represent any kind of information, not just mythological, not just sacred, um, really everything. And um, I had actually, my, one of my first talks at Philosophical Research Society was about that subject because I noticed as I was going through Buddhist texts, alchemical texts, Islamic texts, Christian texts, um, and, and on and on, every tradition had a circular form as a representation of either the universe or a system or a way of presenting information. And um, it, I really, I, I did a, a ton of research for it, as you might imagine. And um, three months after that, this book came out and obviously Manuel Lima was thinking about the same thing. Um, and it's a great resource. Um, it, it, it really shows everything from the Nebra Sky Disk to uh, contemporary uh, graphics used in physics. And he does say, you know, preference for circular shapes is deep, deeply ingrained in all of us from birth. And my personal theory is that it's because the first thing that we actually focus on is the mother's eye. Um, I could be wrong, but it actually, um, from, a, from a, a very basic primal level, the first um, object that you actually focus your eye on often is 
your parents eye. And there's also the sense of play in Coppola's work that I really, I really love. And um, Sandra, who will speak next, uh, talks about a, a playfulness between chaos and cosmos uh, in, in Coppola's opus. Um, and again, it's interesting to see there again that Jung was using uh, the term cosmos to mean order. Um, Sandra wrote a beautiful essay um, for the show that um, Nancy and I liked so much that we actually put it on my website and have access to it. I think it's a beautiful piece of writing. And we asked her if she would actually read it for this uh, particular uh, event so that you could get a sense of the, the work and her reaction to, to Burton Coppolo. Yeah, thank you, David and Will and Dana for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. David, you still need to share the screen though while I speak because you're gonna show the images, no? Hopefully everyone can see this. Okay, yes. good. It's one of my favorites of Jung's. The word mandala means magic circle in Sanskrit. Jung saw the mandala as a God image constituting totality. He also saw it as a reconciliation of opposites. The opposing forces encompass all existence and establish balance, night and day, sun and rain, life and death. Just as all energy issues forth from opposing forces, the psyche also possesses its inner polarity. The principle of opposites embodied in the terrestrial and celestial planes mirrors our psychological constitution. We are light and shadow, consciousness and the unconscious. The theme of this retrospective, Squaring the Circle, and the amazing book that his widow Nancy <clears throat> put together, so aptly, aptly named Paths of Discovery, introduces Burton Coppolo's work with mandalas, which to my eyes and senses are vibrant containers of the tensions of opposites. And likewise, images of wholeness. As Jung put it, it is a fact that symbols by their very nature can so unite the opposites that these no longer diverge or clash, but mutually supplement one another and can so unite the opposites and give meaningful shape to life. This is certainly what we see in Coppola's art, particularly his mandalas, precise circles, squares, and rectangles that hold a world of brightly colored geometrical and circular patterns. Each has a life of its own, dancing within these finely honed contours. To quote Jung, in all chaos, there is a cosmos, in all disorder, a secret order. In all caprice, a fixed law. For everything is grounded on its opposite. Caprice, I feel, is a very good word to describe Coppola's art. There is a playfulness between chaos and cosmos in his opus, revealing a secret order. As Jung put it, without the experience of opposites, there is no experience of wholeness and hence no inner approach to the sacred figures. Inspired from his travels and inward seeking, Coppola's art becomes his, sacred, his approach to the sacred, giving meaningful shape to life. As Coppola shared, I see myself as a painter of the mind, the open consciousness of mind. As the self crystallizes its awareness of externality and its ultimate internality, which I see as the hairline that separates humans from non-human beings. Here, his contemplation of the relationship of externality with what he calls ultimate internality recalls Jung's assertion about the interrelated nature of soul and cosmos. Our psyche is set up in accord with the structure of the universe. And what happens in the macrocosm 
likewise happens in the infinitesimal and most subjective reaches of the psyche. That is the psyche or soul is embedded in, one with and reflective of an ensouled cosmos. Though his no this notion is something the ancients held fast, contemporary culture just now begins to grasp this cosmological parallel with the soul realms and is now being explored in both depth and transpersonal psychology, as well as the new sciences and archetypal psychology, astrology. And we find it here in the world of the arts. Though we are told Coppola usually reserved assigning meaning to his art, to his artwork, to the individual, he did on one occasion clarify the birds. So this is the specific uh, painting that he's referring to, which is just so rich and playful. He says, this is, this, this is Coppola's words, the birds, the bird or birds in this series of paintings becomes the symbol metaphor of the artist's attempt to attain to the higher state of being, the characters, the animals, the harmony of the natural phenomena. The masks act as a transcendent control over the mystical, fantastical, magical, into realistic realms of the artist's vision. I feel this quote revealed a lot about Coppolo in his role as an artist and seeker. Here it seems his artistic expression becomes a form of transcendent control and a means of attaining a more profound state of consciousness. It recalls the role of the shaman who through ritual enters the enchanted dimensions of the ensouled world to join spirit, body and soul to bring about healing, harmony and wholeness for the individual and our community. Lofty business. Thank you, Sandra. At this point, I wanted to speak with Gary and Nancy a bit um, to talk a little bit about Bert himself. And actually, Gary, can you just tell us right off the bat when and how you met Burton? <clears throat> you know, Dana started uh, you know, when we were starting uh, to be introduced himself to me as, or me to him as someone who knew Burton a long time. And I had to think, because I'm a poor historian, but it goes back to the early 60s. And without, you know, I wouldn't pin a historical moment. It's more the kind of cosmic time that I and others were experiencing in the 60s in Los Angeles, where Burton was there. He was present. He was mainly a friend of a mutual friend of ours, an artist who was a visual alchemist, told me in the early 60s that Burton was a guardian of the threshold. So if people would say, well, who's that guy? <laughs> you know, what does he do? You know, you could say, well, that's John Altoon and that's Larry Billy Al Bankston. And that's, you know, the guy that founded the Temple of Man, Bob Baza, and all these, Wally Berman, and all these figures in Los Angeles. And Burton was, I don't know what the archetype is. It's, he reminds me a little of Hafez, except that Hafez was very famous in his lifetime. And I think Burton's recognition comes after his lifetime. But he was an iconoclast. Um, and... So that I'll answer your question. I have some notes of some of the th on some of the things that you and Sandra have said, but let's continue. I want to continue the dialogue, David. Well, that was Mark Checa that said uh, he he uh, he called him the guardian of the threshold. Am I correct? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Did you know Mark? I uh, I did not, but I have read an interview where you talk about Mark. <laughs> Do you know so, what Mark? Well. Well, I know his work. Yes, I, I did. Yeah, I think I it's tangential for another time. But Mark was another incredible. You know, in Los Angeles. Well, go ahead. Let me let me respond to your questions, and anything that doesn't get covered, I want to just add a few notes if we have time. That sounds great. I mean, I actually was going to ask you about the Los Angeles art scene of the 1960s because here in LA, it's considered kind of a watershed period. 
and I know that Burton was aware of it and hung, you know, knew some of the artists and yet, you know, he was not part of the Ferris scene. He was not part of, you know, the things that we associate with, with the emerging art scene here. And it needs yeah. to be said real quick before you get into it, Gary, that yeah. um, there was a, a, a law passed that modern art, contemporary art could not be shown in LA yeah. right. after a, a lawsuit um, that, um, you know, Wally Berman right. uh, actually in his defense wrote art is love is love God. Is God. Um, yeah. But it was a very sketchy time to be trying to promote uh, a contemporary arts art, arts uh, scene here. But, but tell me, tell me a little bit about the '60s and and Bert. Well, you know, I think in all yeah. fairness, I, I'll answer by just taking one step back because your beautiful presentation positioning photos of him in these different eras. Really, it, you know, we begin with Russia and Russian immigrants and his inheriting so many of Russian uh, visual sensibility, you know, of iconography, of Russian constructivism. Uh, I mean, this was like in his veins when he comes, when he comes as a young man into this world of uh, the period that, that Morton Feldman said there was a summer in New York where nobody knew anything. The artists, the musicians, the dancers, we all invented everything, all from the ground up. And Burton loved that spirit, but he didn't get along with their, their programs. Like, he, he told me, abstract expressionism, you know, how much freedom is there in the flick of a wrist? My, you know, versus the stuff we saw, you know. Um, um, <clears throat> so he, he comes out of this milieu of iconic, iconoclasticism in the New York period of the 50s, then comes to Los Angeles kind of at the, kind of at the, the peak of the period when America, having won the war in which he was a, a soldier, becomes the center of kind of Western, you know, sieve, because America becomes the triumphal culture as the one that, you know, we won the war. And Los Angeles becomes the unacknowledged axis because we, Los Angelinos, had created the planes and the movies. So, and, in, and then you get all these expatriates, you know, who came to Los Angeles. So there's this enormous cultural scene of writers, painters, musicians, dancers, and so forth in Los Angeles, which was not recognized because the industry, the art industry, was still New York based. And Burton saw through the art industry, you know, early on, so that like when the Ferris showed Andy Warhol, he saw that as a creation of the art industry. He didn't see Andy as an artist at all. He saw Andy as a product, creating products of something that he would, you know, is kind of easily recognized when you take that position. And from that position in Los Angeles is how he kind of, you know, he moved through the, you know, the milieus, the scenes, the cliques and whatever. And everybody, I think, knew him. And uh, he and he knew everybody, but it was always kind of like he didn't show his work. You'd have to come to his studio, and as you see, it's so eclectic. You know, he could do so many. He didn't have to do particular kinds of art. I was thinking just last night of a, a conversation we'd had about this artist who was showing at La Cienega. He had a career as an artist in La Cienega, and somebody had gone to his studio. And notice these drawings that he did of cowboy fantasies in cosmic space. And they said, wow, why don't you show that stuff? He said, no, the gallery's seen them. They, wouldn't, they can't sell them. So I just do these hard edge stuff, you know. Um, Los Angeles. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's an interesting parallel to my, my question, you know, do we is there order or do we impose it? Um, and yeah. it's interesting that, you know, uh, uh, 
a movement in art is actually created by curators and and what they deem worthy and obviously that's the case and it's, it's interesting that you know what, what you see in a gallery is not reflective of what's really going on um yeah uh, and obviously i can see from what you're saying that his sensibilities ran really counter to ferris which was all about self-promotion um and, and, and to their in their defense, I mean, they wanted to make sure that um, Los Angeles was regarded as a art as an art source at a time when New York was a cultural center or perceived to be the cultural center of, of the country. Um, do yeah. you feel? I mean, you say he didn't show. Do you, how much of that was by choice, and how much of that was by people not people ignoring him? Well, I, I remember a group show he had, and it was downtown in, like, 1963, which was a place that nobody would go to. And that was by choice. It was like the, it was like the Salon de Refusé. And these were all people who were like, you know, I don't belong to, you know, America belong, is the gang that broke off from the other gangs and says we're not a gang, Right. But these were people that were, like, not part of the gang and had a kind of a kindred uh, sense of each other. Um, was it by choice or was he ignored? I don't think he was ignored because I don't think he ever really wanted to play what you would call the game with a capital G, which right. so much of art then and now is of keeping up with the, you know, the theories and the you know the trends and all that stuff and be and and replicating it and and you know modeling it if anything it's even gotten worse because artists are asked to contextualize their own work which i'm not even sure how you how one does that yeah so that's a really interesting thing is when he came to the mandalas you know i mean i remember seeing him i walked down venice beach one day and there's this guy i knew reading on a blanket on his side archetypes of the unconscious how many people in los angeles and santa monica in 19 you know 68 are you know that's not beach literature you know he had really done his homework with all these things but when the chromomorphogenesis work emerged it was like the person who's gone to college and is now able to uh uh, contain the light when it hits them except he was self-taught but when he started doing chromomorphogenesis there was a period when he had a tape recorder as he's on a ladder working on these enormous you know paintings and speaking about what's flowing through him as he's doing it because I think one thing it's interesting to, to consider is that like the Tibetan mandala is a map of a two-dimensional map of a four-dimensional realm or a ten-dimensional realm. And that once you understand, oh, you enter through here and then you will go into this realm. I mean, I once saw, you know, a 3D version of a mandala when they were having a mandala exhibit or a Tibetan art exhibit, except in Burton's case, they're not modeling Euclidean space at all, or time. So, uh, you know, am I, am I answering your question sort of like, you know, how do you position somebody who had to make a name of it up? He had to make up a name for what he was doing. Chromomorphogenesis, meaning that color and form genesis create themselves. That's pretty deep. Just the name. And he came up with a name for it. And uh, you mentioned graffiti. I'm going to just, before we go to the next, any question. Since you mentioned graffiti, you know, he did this before graffiti artists were using those kind of hard-edged senses of sculpting different colored spaces in a kind of a, you know, weave. Or a mesh. I mean, he yes. did that before then. I don't know how, you know, the zeitgeist goes from Burton to all the graffiti artists, but it did. It did. 
Because <laughs> when I was in his studio and I walked out, I didn't see any of that on the street. But, you know, five years later, I started going, oh, my God, there's Burton Coppola's stuff in a wall. You know, it's like, how does that happen? Okay, I'm sorry. Go um, onwards. Well, so, so Nancy, I'm kind of curious. Um, uh, clearly, Burton was well-read and was, um, you know, obviously Jung was a big part of that, but, you know, he was an autodidact. There's a lot of different things he was, he was perusing. Can you tell us a little bit, you know, would he talk about this much to you? Oh, no. <laughs> you know, we, we didn't discuss philosophy. The, the, our discussions about art generally were I'd come home and he'd direct me to the studio if I didn't go there automatically and say, what do you think of what I did today? And, you know, sometimes I would do it with sounds and sometimes I would do it with, I really like the blue part or whatever. And I had to sort of find a way to comment. And he just took what I said for what I said. He was just, ha I think he was just happy that I was reacting to it and, and, and enjoying it and, and that kind of thing. I mean, we, and we did spend a lot of time at museums and uh, I guess they just feasted with our eyes more than anything else. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it's interesting to look at his work because you can see, uh, obviously he was vi extremely visually literate and I, and I feel remiss now for not having brought up um, his heritage and Russian constructivism with some of the work I showed earlier because um, Gary, you're right. I mean, it's imprinted right there. It's almost, you know, it's, it does seem like it's in his DNA and you can actually see some of this other work as an extension of it. Um, I, um, I would love to open it up to have a conversation with all the other folks who've been so patiently uh, waiting around, um, if that works. And, um, you know, we have some other points we'd like to, to touch on, but I'd love, I'd love to um, hear what you guys are thinking. Yeah, David, I'm fascinated by his use of color. And I'm, I'm just wondering if, if he assigned, or maybe Nancy could answer this, was there any symbolic meaning? Did he have a color vocabulary that was meaningful to him? Does anybody know? Well, I can tell you that uh, uh, he did tell me at one point that he wanted me to mix his ashes with cadmium red and put it on all of his paintings. Um, also, and you know, I, I think I'll let Gary tell the story about the, the trip to the Metropolitan Museum of Art when he was a teen. Oh, the Titian. Yeah, Nancy, I've kind of taken a, a more than my share. Oh, if you if you want, I can go ahead. Well, you can you can add anything if I miss because it's, it's a story we both been told. But yeah. uh, he said the reason that he became an artist is, uh, and he always had a huge fondness for uh, illuminated manuscripts, and that whole period mm. of is that there was a color. Uh, Wet, that he saw on a wall as a teenager, and that color blue. Um, do you remember what exactly the colors uh, names of things skip my head? But uh, he it just, was in that, a titian. Yeah, and he just yeah. saw it, and I need to paint. Mm -hmm. That's Lapis lazuli. Something really expensive. Lapis lazuli, yeah, that would be an expensive blue paint. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm just intrigued. I don't know, I just get the feeling that there's relatedness among the parts and pieces of his mandalas. That, that I, I'm, I just have such curiosity. You know, I, I would love to dive in there and, and listen to the dialogue between those different areas of the painting, you know, the sounds that the colors make and, and the, the fragrances that the forms generate. Uh, because I feel they're there. Well, I can uh, also see there's a whole different experience you have when you see the work in person. No doubt. Um, 
it 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 I it it really is remarkable how the colors both vibrate and contrast and 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 uh, work in confluence with one another that really doesn't come across in a JPEG or, or, a, or a, a computer screen. And also do, size matters. Size does matter, yes. Um, and I, that's why I included the photograph of, of someone actually yeah. looking at those paintings. These are 81 by 81 inches. They're huge. And um, Yeah, that's that big also, enough. That's big enough. So it's like walking into a room. Yes. You, you can walk into the feeling of the painting and, and there's and also a lot of in it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also a lot of texture. Um, the, the blacks in some of the paintings aren't black. They're, they're very raised texture. And so they actually have, a, there's a, they're, they're black of course, but there's a depth to them and there's a, there's detail in the blacks and um, there's a shimmer there that you would not get from a photograph. David, um, you mentioned painting. Rothko Chapel. I just want to say that I believe the show has the maquette for the proposed installation of the pieces as a miniature what little city within a city where you go into the space where the paintings are meant to be positioned. Yes, there, there is that. Um, Which, you know, is like a mammoth. That's worth kind of visiting so what, when what, you what see the show. What was his process like? What did he, did he begin and work on these every day? Did he, did he sketch out a plan and then stay with that? How, how, what was his creative process like? Well, he, he, he made the mandalas long before I met him. Um, and he often didn't sketch. Uh, he would just work on the canvas. Although in going through things after he passed away, I did find evidence that he did sometimes sketch certain things out uh, or sort of sketch ideas. But I think a lot of the mandalas, a few of them were very much planned, but I think a lot of them were done in the moment. Exactly. And all the paintings that throughout his career, and he did have an every day, every day, every day practice that made many, many other artists jealous that wow. he was as committed as as he was to painting absolutely every day. Um, and once oh, he, and, go ahead. Once he put paint down, once he, did he revise his images very much at all? Did he put down pink and then, you know, came back? No, 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 that needs to be green or anything like that. Uh, I think there was some of that, but not, not a lot. I mean, he was painting all day. I had to go to work. <laughs> I but know. I, I, I remember. Didn't watch him. Yeah. <laughs> I remember in the, in the Mandala era, era of these large pieces where the color and the form are creating themselves. There was no sketches. He'd be on a ladder because they're huge and discovering the painting while he's painting it. And I just got to add, he didn't use tape. He didn't use a template. When he was in that place uh, that, we, that he called chromomorphogenesis, he could draw straight lines, he could draw circles, he could draw circles yeah. within circles with just crystalline precision. Yeah. Without any, you know, and because the whole hard edge pop movement was the invention, was, was created because you could put masking tape, paint, yeah. pull off the masking tape. And he didn't do that. And they seem very hard edge in of that tradition but they're so soulful if you realize that he was just painting them, creating them out of a, you know, his hand. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, I would like to, to comment, you know, after he studied Jung for so long and, and clearly continued to have a relationship uh, with Jung and, and Jung has said that the, uh, the mon mandala is, it's the collective unconscious. And so I can imagine, I can visualize him being there just steeped in 
in that collective unconscious, he doesn't need tape because that's what's <laughs> guiding his hand. And I'm sure that that um, the feeding, uh, the sustenance that he got from the collective um, is what guided him. He was part of it. He was in it. He was moving into and through the center, which is so much of what mandalas represent. There's a little section that we uh, prepared regarding the center that I would love for Sandra to get into because it, it dovetails beautifully with what you just said, Catherine, if that's okay. Um, we're going to go back to our little share screen moment here. Bear with me. Thank you. Jung recognized the center or point in the circle as the center of all things, a God image. He saw the mandala as the simplest model of wholeness, a vision of God constituting totality, both human and divine. Moreover, he found in the mandala a representation of the reconciliation of offices, which I already mentioned, a psychological process in which the unknown or repressed contents of the psyche are made conscious. Jung called this process individuation. To, to further expound on the center, Jung turned to Plotinus. Plotinus recognized, we were talking about this earlier, that the, the, um, the, the natural draw towards circles. What Plotinus conjectured was that the, the soul's natural movement is, an, is circular. It centers around an interior center. It comes from this center and trends towards it. The soul attaches itself to the center, which Plotinus said all souls should do. This is because the souls of the divinities are directed towards the center. And as he said, that is the secret of divinity. For divinity consists in being attached to the center. In Plotinus's view, those who withdrew from the center wandered as brutes. Now, Eliade really, um, I, I, that's such an interesting image to me when we consider just where we are, you know, at this time in this place on the planet. But I'll go into what Eliade talks about the center, um, the Romanian philosopher. Um, and we know from both Jung and Eliade that the center was a prevalent um, symbol among ancient civilizations across the globe. Depicted with distinct imagery, it was commonly associated with the sacred mountain and the Axis Mundi. Both are lake located at the center of the world. And these images join heaven, earth, and the underworld and allow for a glimpse into this uh, spatial dimension of the center. Moreover, Eliade found that time and space, this is such an interesting concept, that time and space were universally recognized as interwoven within the center. For example, images such as the tree of life and the fountain of youth and immortality were all considered located at the center. Their intertwined nature infers this union of time and space. Thus, it would seem that the center is at, at once contains time and space, yet it exists beyond both, as these ancient symbols would imply. Jung, too, understood this interwoven nature in the context of the psyche. So crucially, Eliade found that in archaic civilizations, the reality, this is, this to me too is so relevant to where we are, that, the re, that in archaic civilizations, the reality and enduringness of any construction was assured through ritual. This was so because every consecrated space was seen as coinciding with the center of the world. Just as the time of any ritual occurred simultaneously with the mythical time of the beginning. Through the repetition of the cosmogonic act or the creation myth, a, a concrete time is projected into mythical time. 
when the foundation of the world occurred. And so it was in this way that the sustainability of any construction was assured. The, the center was, in, in this way, the center was deemed a sacred zone of absolute reality, where creation itself takes place, where, as Eliade put it, the unmanifest is manifest and chaos becomes cosmos. Because of this creative potential, the cosmogony was ritually reenacted within the center. This ensured, uh, basically brought everything back to life. It ensured sustainability of, of, of uh, the crops, of society, of um, the, the life-giving potential. You know, it renewed everyone, including the gods, which is a really interesting notion. And Jung saw the center as a rite of passage. It reflects both the journey and a discovery of the self, the God image. The road to the center is a rite of passage that has been universally acknowledged as wrought with peril. These dangers, uh, noted Eliade, are mirrored in the elaborate constructions of ancient temples the world over, as well as in the pil pilgrimages to sacred places, the labyrinths, and dangerous, the dangerous voyages of the mythic heroes. These perils are not unlike those found within the psychological process of individuation or mirrored in the mandala. Eliade said that a rite of passage from the profane to the sacred, from the ephemeral and illusory to reality and eternity, from death to life, from man to divinity, the rite of passage or individuation in Jungian terms is a process wherein one journeys from the mundane or ego consciousness into the unconscious. Confronting the shadow is the first of many steps in this process wherein the unconscious is explored through dream analysis, synchronicities, active imagination and other relevant modes. This winding path depicted in the mandalas leads towards the sacral, sacred, eternal, luminous, and life-giving center, or the self with a capital S in, in union terms, towards our God image and totality. I love this labyrinth, thank you. <laughs> you are very welcome. <laughs> um, I, we have not heard from Clay. I'd be curious to see what he is thinking. Well, I'm fascinated. Um, I was wondering if in any of his work, if he uh, ever used uh, integrated words and the spatial relationships between words uh, and how and, and symbols as they would uh, be in relation to one another. Well, in, in going through all of this stuff, I found some sort of experiments with that, but I don't think he... Uh, and he did play, he did, we did once talk about, did he ever write poetry? And he was like, uh, yeah, but no. <laughs> yeah, I find it fascinating to, uh, um, to integrate that into, into mandalas. Mandala, the Sanskrit word for circle. A circle designed to have meaning of a cosmic order. This is my mandala, my life in symbols, in sacred geometry. In the relationship, in the white spaces between the words, created and recreated over many years growing in depth and breadth as I grow. A reflection of my expanding consciousness.
unfolded within the universal circle, revealing who I truly am. Pulling all the scattered aspects of my life together. One tiny pencil stroke at a time. Here I find my center. Knowing that I will create it again and again. As I evolve and grow with time. The spatial relationship between two symbols or, or even two ideas side by side or one above the other or the other like that communicates a different message well, and meaning. And then, yeah. If you look at some of the old, earlier mandala images that, that David showed, uh, there were some, some of that. He did experiment with that before, uh, I think before he became a full-time artist, but I think that was part of his journey was to, to, to sort of take those symbols and things and sort of repeat them and play with them before mm -hmm. he, he discovered, but what's me? Right. So, uh, so I'm making that up because just from what I've seen of his work. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can see that transition. Yeah. And he did, now that you do say it, he did play with that stuff for sure. Mm, thank you. Um, Will, you, you, had, you were trying to ask a question earlier, and somehow you got bulldozed, and I'd like to rectify <laughs> that. <clears throat> oh, thanks. Well, you know, I mean, there, there's so many questions and thoughts that this all brings up from, from his work, and also just some of the things that, that everybody said. Um, the, the thing that I was thinking about then that was so inspiring, that, and I want to come back to what you said about the mother's eye, because I found that to be fascinating. Um, at that moment, what I was really wanting to, to respond to is Gary was talking about this scene in, in uh, LA, this art scene in LA. I, um, I'm a department chair and a professor of a lot of, of college age artists, filmmakers, dancers, musical theater uh, performers. And, um, and I had the privilege of getting to teach them uh, the story of Athens this last week and Athens just after they had defeated Persia. And it's just after they defeated Persia that they become this cultural center that all this art explodes from Athens and it's the one generation where they're making it up as they go. And it's the central person is somebody who knows that they don't know. And you just said like all of those things in like a cluster of like 30 seconds about the LA art scene. They knew they didn't know is this new cultural center. They had just defeated the big, you know, enemy abroad and now this explosive art scene. And it's exactly something I say about my school as well. My school is young. You know, we've, we've graduated like four sets of students and we've done great. We've, placed on all the uh, top film school lists and all that kind of stuff since then. But it's unique because we are making it up as we go. And I try to tell our students that that's really uh, lucky for them because it's when you're making it up as you go, you take creation off a pedestal and you just do it. And I don't know, I, I don't know if I have a question or anywhere to take that, just that I was really inspired by, by what you said, uh, Gary. And I'm sure that that will be repeated to my students for many years. <laughs> Thank you. We make the road, uh, um, yeah. and the road that, makes us. That's true. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to go back to that comment about the, the I being the, the first thing that we focus on. Mm -hmm. I, I suggest even before that, the first circle we focus on is the breast the source of nourishment that uh, that first little, you know, the little kid has to latch onto in order to survive. But even pushing it back earlier than that, there's the encoding that, that takes place in the womb and that safe holding place of the, you know, the muscles of the uterus that literally hold us in a spherical form for those nine, nine-ish months that were in the mother. So um, I, I, I did do a little bit of research on this to sort of double check myself. Um, and I am not an expert in infants, but um, apparently the, the breast is actually, and the nipple is more of a physiological uh, response. Uh, and, and that's the first, uh, it's a tactile nourishment, as you said. 
uh-huh. but it's the eye that the infant looks at and 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 recognizes. And you know, there's a, there's a, a period of time where the infant is not um, focusing, and so they're they're getting nourishment from the breast. They're they're uh, seeing you know kind of this blurry world, and as it gets into um, as it resolves itself, as it um, that is when they're where they're looking at the eye. Because I someone actually brought this up when we did the, the talk at PRS. I I was said that oh the mother's eye, and somebody in the audience went or, or the breast, and everybody laughed. And I was like oh well, what did, what did you say? And that, that that's exactly what they did. So I did a little homework on that. Um, okay, good, good on you. Yeah. That, well, that there's another go. way to to take all of that. Actually, there's <laughs> the, the um, really interesting as well. One and actually womb, breast, and eye all together. Um, if you go back to one of the earliest figurines we've ever found, the earliest class, like sets of figurines are these eye goddesses. And these eye goddesses, actually, the eyes and the breasts are conflated and they're eye breasts. And one of the ways we interpret this is that we is that the eyes nurse us into existence like the breasts do. A mother's eyes see us into existence in the same way that the breasts nurse us into existence. And then this, by the way, then, of course, the, the feeling then that comes from this eye breast is that womb feeling of safety and security. So it's like, mm-hmm. it's funny that to, we can pull these apart, but in the same way, emotionally, they're all triggering each other. And we can see it in the ancient art in these ancient icons of these eye breast mother figures. And that's what I was so inspired by with this idea that maybe it's maybe not the eye, but it's maybe all of these, this whole complex of the mother's eye breast womb <laughs> uh, that's triggered when we see the mandala. And if the mandala gives us this sense of uh, blissful peace and tranquility and reduction of stress and all these types of things, I wonder if we might compare the emotional reaction to the mandala to the emotional reaction of the mother's eye wound breast uh, that, that get conflated in iconography. Yeah, I, I think that mandalas, that's, that's the healing power of creating mandalas is that it allows us to check in with you know that home base of the circle where we begin our existence and are ushered into culture and relationships so when we need to you know young young people made mandalas when they were in crisis and they fell apart and so they fell back into that contact with the original ground from which they emerge that that mandala and then grew themselves back out from there um, th- that's one thing I find so fascinating about uh, Burton's years long fascination with mandalas is he was kind of hanging in that space where most people just dip into it and then leave they they get their bearings again and then go back to being a CPA or, or whatever. He was definitely a gifted and uh, prophetic person. I, I, I it's clear to me. Uh, and what a gift that that we're allowed to see these images now, when we need them more than ever. <laughs> Suzanne, I wanted to to just kind of tag on to what you said that with my experience of painting the mandalas is that not only is the center, I believe our unconscious center, it's it's a threshold for coming and going. Yeah. And so we can begin there going back to our discussion of eyes and breast and womb and cervix, dare I say, that is round and gets to, yeah, yeah. you know, um, uh-huh. that's right. That's right. Um, that it's where we begin and it's also where we end um, it, going to that center, having not died, I don't know, but <laughs> Um, but to imagine that at birth, um, if we are focusing on the mandala, that it's all pinpointed right there. And I would hope that my death will be the same way. Yes. Amen. Yes. That it returns back to that, that point with all the, the collective unconscious self 
all of these things swirling about. Um, that's how we began. And I believe that's how we end as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, hala. <laughs> well, actually, um, Bert's last, some of Bert's last speech was to ask me and his daughters to draw mandalas for him. <gasps> mm. And uh, the, the monad and circles and squares within with circles within them. And uh, yeah, so maybe that is where we go. <laughs> mm. Well, circles <laughs> are the one shape that you can say is divine because the circle is always equivalent in principle to all other circles. Everything else is particular, separate. It has fallen away from the divine. The uh, Copernicus was one who said, you know, the universe is spherical and but, every, uh, you know, a lot of people have said that. I mean, a lot of people have, have attributed roundness, spherical, um, circularity, uh, the evolution of the psyche. All of these are, are wanting to return to that sense of wholeness and completeness and wanting uh, an egg. You know, I mean, these are all timeless metaphors for divinity manifesting itself in the physical world. You know, to add on that, the, the circle with the point is the alchemical symbol of the sun and of gold. And then, of course, eventually later, people would want to point to the gold or the spheres, spherical atoms as the soul atoms. But of course, that's not the original atomist. But that emerged, uh, you know, just building on that idea. I, uh, I'm trying to call up a comment from uh, a colleague of mine um, who is uh, uh, watching uh, from a distance, just getting back to the visual for a quick moment. I don't want us to stay on the eye for forever, but it was an interesting point. Um, a, a, a psychologist I know wrote, uh, it has to do with visual perception and the sinusoidal waves that combine to form patterns the eyes and smile of mothers are the perfect difference apart to ideally fit with the parabolic shape of the sinusoidal wave of visual perception. Um, so that again, the, the physiology uh, going back to that. I, I do that, wonder, you know, yes, go ahead, Will. Well, does that explain why I've always found it fascinating that babies look you in the eye? I'm like, who told them? Who taught them? I can't get my college students to know they're supposed to look me in the eye. But the babies <laughs> freaking know it? Is this the evidence of soul or, or what? You know, how do the babies know to look you in the eye? Is, are you saying that there's just a natural comfort with I, that? I, 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 I am. It's the first thing they can huh. see. Huh. And um, I, I um, as far as I have been able to learn, again, I am not a specialist in infants, but we all know that if you've hold, held a baby, that's where they're looking. And um, I think part of it is, you know, they say dogs look at the left side of the face because that's where you betray your emotion. Um, I, did, I did a whole series on, on symmetry and faces. Um, and um, that was something that came up. And um, it's, it's interesting that instinctively that's where they're looking to see, you know, how you're reacting to something, what you're really, you know, and that's why sometimes even if you're being as friendly as you think you are uh, at approaching a dog, <laughs> they can start to back away because they can actually see like, uh oh, I think I'm going to the VET. Um, I'd just like to drop in a little other, a, a, a little more information here about how the, 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 the face approaches a circular form. And the features are, are in the center of the face. And, and uh, I, I, I'm sure, I know I'm attracted by movement. My eyes go to the movement. So when features, when eyes are moving, mouth is moving, when we talk to a baby, you know, that it's all rich material for them to take in. I would yes. like to add too that, you know, go, and again, going 
not not uh, going too far away from our mandalas, that if we consider um, the center, we're talking about the babies with my own two infants, <laughs> I would do this thing of closing my eyes. I would be, you know, staring into their eyes and they into mine. And I would close my eyes just to see how long it would take them. And they would start whining and, you know, experiencing this discomfort. And as soon as I would open them again, there would be an ease, a connection again. And this is again, when you can play peekaboo with, with babies Mm-hmm. And they think you are gone when they can't see your eyes. Mm-hmm. And they so think we- they are gone when they're under a napkin or whatever you play with them with. Yeah. So it's an interesting. Does the mandala trigger that reaction where we feel seen? Where to feel seen, you know, like that's why all the alien eyes are huge because they give us that feeling of being seen, the other seeing us. Do you think that that's triggered by the mandala, that, that feeling? I think mandalas are a mirror for us. Hmm. And, and so in a way we're looking at our own face when we look hmm. at a mandala. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I again, think that- Will, I think it gives us, um, it takes us to our own center. I, I'd, I'd like to <laughs> respond to that too. You know, when my daughter was drawing, she went through a phase of, of really, just in her journal, she was regularly drawing mandalas. And, but she was not, I mean, she didn't have Burton's talent to make exact and she wasn't using, you know, any um, compasses or, or not compasses, but I mean, think what are the, what's the- uh, Templates. Yes, she wasn't using any templates. She was just doing them by hand. And one night she dreamt in the dream, a voice told her that she needed to be more precise with her mandalas because they matched up with the stars. Oh, there, yeah. Yeah, That's there perfect. it is. There, there, to me, there's the cosmos, you know, the, yeah. the macrocosm in the, in the microcosm. There's that, you know, what Jung said, there's the infinite, you know, that reaching. I mean, when we're seeing the mandala, we're, we're you know, we're traveling through soul, you know, the, the, the cosmos reflected in our souls. I mean, that's, that to me, with her dream, I thought, well, that, <laughs> that's yeah. something that You know, the Tibetan word for mandala is kilkor, which means center and everything around it. And so that bridges, you know, of course, we're the center of our own world, but that incorporates every, everything. So uh, that's... Uh, I love that. Can yeah. we really be the center if we don't <laughs> if we don't have something around us? Is that dot truly the center without all the rest ar- around it? And and in it's Burton, relational. Yeah. Right. And so in right. Burton's work as well, I would venture to say any portion of it taken apart from the from the whole it would no longer be the mandala. I think, yeah, I think all of it has to be there to hold together. It's like a a keystone of bricks that's built a certain way so that there's this, you know, they all have to be there in order for the structure to to stand. I mean, it's also fascinating to see how uh, different cultures employ the form. You know, I showed an Enso earlier, which is more of a gestural move, but it is a circle. Um, and there's also um, the idea of indigenous uh, Native American culture where, you know, Black Elk famously said, you know, if you need to know where the center of the universe is, draw a circle. OK, so the, the end. So, you know, is, you guys probably you know, may know that, like, there's sometimes even heated debates about how to draw the end. So should it be closed or should it be open? And there are two totally divergent schools. And I think that this points to a, another a dimension in the mandala that I think might be interesting to talk about, because on one level, the circle with the point in it, it's also the perfect shape of the ego, the, the, this individual with a shell around it. And when you describe to be in the center with everything around you, you're, you're putting yourself in relation to everything. 
Whereas I think that some mandalas where you have a hard boundary, it also can serve as Freudian wish fulfillment that I'm actually safe and enclosed. But that also can just be ego wish fulfillment to have that enclosed, overly safe, solid shell womb. Sometimes that's what we need because we need to go into it to be reborn. Mm -hmm. But I just mm -hmm. think it's really interesting to bring up this, this tension between the idea of the closed and open, the, the circle that's a shell and the circle yeah. that's a surrounding. Curious if anybody has any thoughts about that. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I find that interesting. And, and in the mandalas I see and the mandalas I create, it varies. There are times when there's no boundary and times when there are thick boundaries and that correlates with whether I'm feeling vulnerable or whether I'm feeling uh, a need to contain emotion um, or protect myself. Yeah. There's also the idea of, um, and I use it in gardening called controlled chaos. <laughs> and so there's that, that um, the idea of, if, if, if it is too contained, then it's very easy then to slip back into the ego, um, thinking that you are literally uh, the center when indeed, mm -hmm. well, I don't think we are. Um, anyway, just that idea of, of um, how to create um, cosmos within within the chaos well i think sometimes with with mandalas there's an aspect of that from a formal perspective where sometimes you're creating something that's tightly controlled and balanced in order to free the mind to meditate upon it and go elsewhere and so you may be employing very strict symmetry and very strict um, um proportions and ratios but what you're really trying to do is create a form of order from which the you know the per, the perceiver the, can go through that to open mm. up. It's like it's like repeating a mantra. Yes, it is precisely, mm -hmm. precisely, and um, you know, and, and there's a lot of um, yeah repeating a mantra. Um, there's a great line by Brian Eno: "A repetition is a form of change." Um, hmm. where each time you do something, it's, it's a completely different world you're doing it in. And, and so, you know, and, and you may be a different person than you were the first time you approached mm -hmm. it. I think repeating a mantra is exactly like that. Um, you, you shift. You wouldn't know it from this conversation, but I meditated this afternoon and I had uh, that exact, exact experience. Um, Gary, since we're talking about mandalas and oneness and things like that you do you want to hop in and hop i'll say something that i was taught by uh, my teacher Thich Nhat han uh about uh the enso because he incorporates the enso in his work he puts words inside of his his in his own calligraphy and words that he's written so you have the writing the calligraphy of the word and then the art of the Enzo, which are the three classical treasures in the East. Uh, he said once, uh, when you make uh, an Enzo, you follow your in-breath and your out-breath. And that cycle would be the Enzo. And if you do that, you're no longer trying to make a perfect circle. You're no longer trying to draw anything. You're being guided in the moment um, by the uh, inherent, you know, performativity of the universe breathing in and breathing out. And so for me, that's what an ENSO is. Whether they're open or closed is, you know, totally an interesting kind of, you know, do you put the, the red feather on the kachina's right shoulder or the left shoulder? This is meaningful, but, um, you know, I, I, so do I have any thoughts? I always wonder how come Zoom uses rectangles instead of circles or, or spheres? Why aren't we in little spheres? <laughs> um, and when you, you know, when you go out in the world after tonight, ask yourself, do you see the world in a square frame 
or do you see the world with kind of a round vision? And, the, and then the next thing I'd ask is, are there any edges anywhere? Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm thinking about the, the uh, thank you so much for that. The in, the out, the moon waxing, the moon waning, the sun rising with the light, sun going out with the light, with the day and the year up and down. Just all these that I, I did not know that about the end. So or if I did ever, I've forgotten it. Thank you. That that connects a whole lot of things that are meaningful to me. Um, the idea is in Zen that one instant of consciousness is the whole universe. Hmm. May I someday see it? <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> you are it. <laughs> you know, it reminds me of another thing that's so interesting too, is, is that whole, we're talking about where's the center, draw the circle in the center. And we've talked about some uh, quantum mechanics and stuff like that a little bit earlier. And you think about the big bang and, and from that point of view, everything is expanding from the center and everywhere is the center from which everything is expanding, you know? And so there we have our center and circumference. And I love that idea about the, the end. So too, we haven't mentioned that. I'm sure all of us have had the thought, the center circumference thought. And, and I also think about the volcano to me, I had, um, uh, I went through a series of seizures and, and sleep paralysis and it all kicked off for me with this image of myth of Sisyphus trying to get the boulder up the hill. And, I was trapped in an image of truth, which was a mountain with a perfect singular truth on top. Thank you, Sisyphus and, and Camus, for giving me this image of one truth that's supposed to fit on top of the mountain. After months of depression and all this kind of stuff not being able to figure it out, eventually I was laying in bed and the mountain erupted into a volcano. And Ooh. I saw the volcano constantly circulating everything through the center and to the outside and center of the outside. And I saw that the hoarding of the volcano, the hoarding of the dragon and the mountain was the, was the real problem. Um, anyway, so that's my mandala, is, is the volcano, the most precious one to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Adding that to the slideshow, an overhead hmm, cool. volcano. Well, and the birth of the volcano would certainly be a circle, you know, as it's breaking through the Earth's crust and it, it's coming into being. I mean, it's, it's all, this whole notion of, you know, we called this exhibit and the talk squaring the circle, which to me reeks of a kind of human imposition on the divine. Like when you talk about squaring something that can't be squared, um, you, you, you can surround it, but you're really imposing uh, a, a human construct upon something that is a principle of divinity. Well, to me, it expands to me and to I keep thinking about it too, is circularity is so associated with femininity and curves with femininity and square lines and right with masculinity. So what you're saying where it's imposing a uh, human on the divine also may be imposing a uh, masculine on the feminine or uh, a pursuit of finding a way, how can we see the circular through, how can we see the, how can we see wholeness from the masculine point of view, like, is it possible? Can it be done? I don't know, but, but is, is wholeness fundamentally feminine with the circular and circularity? Or can we get to a hyper-rational, logical angle through which we can also perceive wholeness? I don't know. Well, and the only place that you can get with the square on the inside doesn't contain the circle. You know, you can, you can put a square in some alchemy drawings the square is inside the circle, but it certainly doesn't contain the circle at that point. So what you're talking about is privileging patriarchy uh, over this whole notion of the divine feminine, which the circle represents. And of course it gets, and, and I, I see that. And then I also know my own, like, you know, truth is notionless, right? Because then the square is also associated with the root chakra, which is the material chakra, which is associated more with feminine mater, mother, matter. So, so the square is also fundamentally material. Uh, is that, that, that material realm, which is also tends to be associated with the feminine. So maybe I just gotten confused enough uh, to, to be where I should be. I don't know. Well, you know, the, the original, meaning of, of squaring the circle was uh, a medieval conundrum 
that the alchemists tried to to settle that they were also geometers and um, uh, the struggle was to find to be able to create a circle with the same area as the square that would be built from upon the circle and it can't be done it's it's one of those uh, uh, mysteries and so that's that's the source of the mystery about squaring the circle so it wasn't Apollo 13. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a different. Now for something completely different, but David is on a roll here. I'm just going to Wow, you, the, the, here it oh, is. Oh, David. Michael Mayer, I think, right? But you were going to say something. Oh, well, the Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man uh, refers to an, an, a completely different other way, which is actually a way that I incorporate in my daily life, which is the idea that the absolute dimension or the transcendent dimension and the historical dimension are um, not separate. And the way we see that realized by da Vinci's drawing is that the human form can embrace and touch the square, which is ours quadrata, which is the rectilinear world of historical dimension. And yes, a male historic history, not herstory. And the uh, circular, which is the ours uh, rotunda, which is in his era, the imagination, which, you know, resonates very much in the Jungian sense of the active imagination. And that in that we, we touch on both, the square and the circle, in that sense of the, you know, person who stands and reaches out. And that's all. <laughs> it is interesting. What I was going to say earlier, um, when, when, when Will was uh, bringing up the point of the masculine and the feminine, um, is that, you know, as, to your point, Gary, yeah, your, your eye, there is no edge and it is not a square. And uh, as is a camera lens, uh, early, early photography, they were round, um, they were round images and we imposed a, a rectangle over them. And it's, it's a great metaphor for shaving off what we see. And, you know, I, I think there's something else too that we're, we're, we're dancing around here, which is using something material to depict the immaterial. And the, the idea that, you know, so much is outside our perception and whether you view that from a spiritual standpoint or a physical standpoint, um, it, it's true in both instances. Um, if you think going back to quantum physics that we don't perceive 94% of what is out there, um, you, something like 50%, 50 percent, 50 something percent is, is dark energy and 20 something percent is, is dark matter. Um, and we still don't know what it is. Um, or if you think about the, the wavelengths of light that, that um, you know, work outside of our, our visual spectrum, um, the obvious ones are ultraviolet, but there's, you know, if you look at, at, the, at the bandwidth, it goes on for quite a while. Um, and I think almost like Ernest Becker said, you have to sort of deny the fact that you're going to die in order to live a fulfilling life. I'm paraphrasing wildly, um, and, and some may argue with that. I think that sometimes we like to create our little pockets of control, A, to contain, as, as you were saying earlier, but also perhaps to become a portal to begin to attempt to experience uh, the, the larger. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like to comment. I wanted to say a couple of things about the center. The I, I, I'm trying to... Um, when we consider the the mandala again, as Eliari saw it as a as a rite of passage, you know, if we're sitting and meditating on a mandala, to reach that center, to become that center, is a process, just like the individuation journey. That's a process. It's not something that we we can achieve in one sitting to become that center. This is a, a lifetime journey. It's like the the labyrinths. It's like the the, um, the, the stairs of the ziggurats and the, and the pyramids, there's an inherent danger as we 
as we travel into inner space, you know, where we find outer space reflected in, in ancient civilizations, the, the um, social and political order was designed by the cosmic order. Now we lost that, you know, this, this, this arose in the fourth century in, in Mesopotamia. It traveled to, through the centuries, it tra it's archetypal in nature. It traveled to, um, like this was based on the, the, the astrologer, uh, astrologer, astronomer, priests, you know, mm -hmm. their long time observation of the stars to create the order on earth, right? And, and law and, and, and uh, social order. And so this traveled from Mesopotamia to uh, ancient Egypt, to India, to China. And then by the 12th century, it reached Mesoamerica. Now, this is something that um, this order that's based on the cosmos that's, you know, within us. And, you know, we, 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 we cut this off. We've sort of been spinning in space for, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, since, let's say, patriarchal times that said, you know, astrology is a sin. And, and so we lost that in, innate wisdom to, to um, basically <laughs> live in a, in a harmonious manner. Victor Havel, the, um, in 1990, the, the Czech president, who was also a poet, he said that, you know, there is a world democracy that is, is you know, sort of seeded. And, but that will be based on basically the, the, the authority of the cosmos, you know, where we all recognize our, this transcendent force that unites us, you know, both within and without. Now, that's a real interesting vision. You know, when we think about Jung saying the psyche is, is you know, I mean, we, we find that order in the cosmos and it travels to the, you know, the deepest part of our psyches. Now, my, own, my personal experience of that when we were talking about meditating was after four days of a, of a Zen retreat and make Chik Yat Han rest in peace. After four days of a Zen retreat, sitting on a you know on the the cushion with the zabutan underneath this was i found myself this was just i found myself in space in the cosmos and in front of me i mean literally the whole cosmos and in front of me was a, a humming i heard like a golden humming and then i saw the buddha humming in front of me and as i turned to the right, there were a thousand Buddhas at my side. And I turned to the left and it was the same thing. And then I looked down at my Zabutan and it was like a magic carpet and the, the whole cosmos was reflected through it. Th there was the perfect example of, of, of that. That was after four days, of course I have never achieved that since, but you know, that, was a, that was a retreat. But there it is, there's the, 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 you know, the, the macrocosm in the, in the microcosm and that, that order is something, you know, that, that let's say, um, Clay, like on your program, I saw Richard Tarnas speaking. You know, this, this is something that the archetypal astrologers are, are, are talking about, something that the Mesoamerican um, wise men, the Tlamit Nime, were speaking of, that, you know, goes back all the way to, to ancient Mesopotamia. Like I said, this, this is something that is, you know, is possible through these kind of communities, uh, through mandala art therapy through you know these are processes but you know this is what's unfolding this is like the the egg that you know you were talking about Dana this is where we're I mean to me this is a potential that that you know these kind of communities and this kind of work can can create and foster as we you know stand in the Kairos you know spinning and climate changing and, and uh, social divide and, and um, the global pandemic, you know, which takes on form after form. But, you know, this is, this is an, you know, this is a rich conversation and I'm, I'm really grateful to be a part of it. It's, it's very exciting. Well, and, and, and certainly uh, Burton's chromomorphogenesis, which he eventually shortened to chromorphism, these, paintings that are 81 by 81 inches almost seven foot and larger 24 a series of 24 paintings 
he intended them to be something like that would be transformative, that if someone could take the time to see them as he intended, and if you are able to attend the, the, the show, the model is in the auditorium, which shows how he ex- intended to have the pieces shown. He, his idea was that you would start with the mandalas and move through some these other images through his journey in paint as well, from mandalas as uh, Clay brought up that were that had more symbolism and things in them and then into abstraction, which is what he really became his favorite, favorite thing. Um, and then taking those mandalas and tearing them apart and turning them into other things. He, he expected this to be a, a, a tr- transformative journey, uh, just as mandalas, I think, are in and of each one of them. So I think that's enough. Do you know if the um, dimensions were themselves significant. Uh, I noticed that the dimensions of one side, a lot of them are 81 by 81, but some, but 81 seems to be used in a lot of them. Is there a reason why he picked 81? If I had to guess, uh, 81 inches, if you, 81, a painting that's 81 inches by about two or three inches, and if you tip it diagonally, it will get through a standard door. <laughs> Anything larger than that wouldn't fit. So I you, think that might be, uh, if you could have gone know, bigger, I think, in fact, the, the, the first image of the, uh, of the, of the series is, is a canvas that is too big to fit through the door. But uh, I think that's where the 81 inches started. Is this, you know, maybe it's, pure accident but from a sacred geometrical point of view 81 8 plus 1 is 9 and 9 times 9 is 81 mm-hmm. and 9 is 0 in sacred geometry and so basically 81 is a, is a number that that goes to 0 it's emptiness and the mandala is an expression of emptiness um and that's well, what i'm saying so it's cool about the end so you know when it's it's empty inside the anatman the emptiness inside. i wasn't going to feed the beast but 81 <laughs> is the number of verses in the Tao Te Ching. Ah, that's why you were asking. Well, I was mm-hmm. I was asking. I didn't offer <laughs> it, but you know, it it is one of those numbers that um why wasn't it 78? Why wasn't it 80? I mean, you know, um 80 fits through the door just as well as 81 if it, you know, and I don't know. I was was 81 uh, well, uh, a consciously chosen number, maybe. It could be both. Well, which came first, the door or the mandala? <laughs> <laughs> there has to be a wall for you to create a door. <laughs> I thought the mandala was a door. Right? <laughs> <laughs> David, I have a question for you. You showed, when you were showing the alchemical squaring the circle, there was one quote that you went you went by too quickly, and so I didn't get to see it. Would you show that again? I was really Did hoping you, you wouldn't ask me that. Oh gosh, okay. Well, don't. And you could just but, read it to me, the quote, because I, yeah. I I missed that. I, I will I will go there. I it's it's because it's a, it's a little bit of a dodgy source. Um, oh, it's a dodgy source. Oh, right. Was this the Wiki Religions? Wiki, okay. it's Wiki Religions. Yeah. In terms of the spirituality and philosophy, the square of the circle means to see equally in all the four directions, and also to treat everyone with equal respect. Uh, the, the second half of that, I, 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 I right. suspect maybe an invention on Wiki yeah. Religion's part. Right. Um, certainly, seeing oh. in all the four directions uh, makes seems. Uh, you just see somewhat... equally in all four directions. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, when we just even when we think about the um, the, the quaternity, you know, the the, the four um, cardinal points that. That would that would make sense. In terms of, in terms of dimensions, I mean, it's an interesting question always because you know, my 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 suspicion would be that it would be a, a little of both, in that clearly, uh, Burton Coppola was highly educated in alchemy. He studied theosophy because that was a huge artistic influence on many different artists. Um, Pete Mondrian. Um, you know, uh, Kandinsky, or mm-hmm. card-carrying theosophists, um, Apollinaire, um, Melovic. Um, but um, 
it, and he, he obviously was studying many traditions, which is why he wound up at a place like the Philosophical Research uh, Society, because they had all these different texts from all these different traditions in one place. So I wouldn't be surprised if the answer was he, it needed to fit through a door and, oh, eight and one is nine. Um, there's a famous story of Akira Kurosawa where he liked, he had a shot in Ron that's the opening frame and someone said, you know, Scorsese asked him, why, why did you choose that exact frame? And he said, because an inch to the left was the Sony factory and an inch to the right was, the, was, was a highway. Um, so this was the biggest vista that I could create. It's a beautiful book. And if you, um, yeah, it is a beautiful book. It is. Um, See, beautiful book. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it's a wonderful book. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> I also think we'll we ought to take just a moment and point to the cha uh, changing of the gods oh. that we're doing next Thursday as part of our pulling focus series. You want to say a little bit about that, or yeah, sure. I mean, and that's changing. You know, that's really changing out of this. So, any last thoughts or comments about the the mandala before before I mention next you know next uh, week's event? Okay, just wanted to check. Thank you. Um, well, uh, the ultimate mandala of the cosmos, or at least of our solar system, we're going to be looking at planetary alignments um, this this next week. And so, some of you guys know who Dr. Richard Tarnas is, who's the head of education for a while at Esalen. A uh, Harvard philosopher uh, wrote a book, Passion of the Western Mind, which is the philosophy text that I use for my philosophy class with college students. Um, but Dr. Tarnas continued his work into planetary astrology. And so there's a documentary series coming out on that, Changing of the Gods. And some of you may be really interested in astrology. Some of you may be really interested in depth psychology and the archetypes, you know, Mars, Venus. So that even if you're not interested in astrology, and some of you may be storytellers, who are interested in the alignment of macro and micro narratives and the synchronistic uh, alignment of the big story and the little story. And now we're, we're going to be looking at this from all of those angles. We'll have Becca Tarnas with us. We'll have Saffron Rossi with us, um, Richard Tarnas, and then the director, Kenny Alcibel, Alcibel who's also the head of Bioneers. Uh, some of you may know uh, about a pretty cool uh, conference on circular economies and that kind of stuff. So we're really looking forward to it. We're going to do a screening. It's a very special thing. We have only like five groups are getting to pre-screen, pre-premiere uh, this event. So we're going to screen the first episode. Uh, Pacifica Alumni Association has come on board to help support that with us. Um, so we're just really excited. It's going to be a really cool night. We're going to screen this very short first episode, talk with some of our favorite people, and uh, see if um, Earth is it is in heaven, I suppose. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay. What a beautiful evening, everyone. Yeah. Thank I'd you. I'd like to thank everybody for participating. Uh, I, I didn't mean to, to interrupt you, Dana. Not I, at I all. I want to say thank you. I wanted to say thank you for, for having us and, and thank you for half the people here I met for the first time this evening. Um, and I, I really want to thank you for, uh, for, for participating and, and sharing your knowledge and experience. Well, and thank you. And I, I have a real warm spot for PRS, as you know. So, and Sandra, nice to see you again. Likewise. Thank and you so much for having me. Nancy, wonderful to meet you. And thank you very much for the book. I really okay. do. I'm, I'm honored. And Gary, nice to meet you. Gary uh, Gaffer, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> all right. And Suzanne, Catherine, always a pleasure. Clay, wonderful. All right, let's take just a moment. I want a moment of silence before we go home for the evening. Okay. Peace, everyone. Love you all. Thank you very much for coming. And David, you're a joy. All right. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Great to be with everybody. Thank you. Good Take night. care. All right. Bye.